Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. As always, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Now is actually a great time to join because you'll receive two months free when you pledge annually before the 30th of June 2023. Join the Talking Tudors Patreon community to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to enter patron-only monthly giveaways. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited that joining me on the show to talk about Catherine Parr and the new feature film Firebrand is Elizabeth Fremantle. Elizabeth is the critically acclaimed author of four Tudor historical novels, Queen's Gambit, which is soon to be the feature film Firebrand, Sisters of Treason, Watch the Lady and the Girl in the Glass Tower. As E.C. Fremantle, she has written two gripping historical thrillers, The Poison Bed and The Honey and the Sting. Her novel, Disobedient, about the artist Artemisia Gentileschi, will be published in July 2023. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Elizabeth. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I've been um, following you for for quite a long time, actually. So it's great to great to be chatting. Yes, it's lovely to have you here. And I've been really looking forward to our conversation. So let's just start by you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Okay, well, I'm Elizabeth Fremantle, and I've my seventh novel is being published this July. So I've written a well, there are four novels that are Tudor set, or specifically Tudor set. All my novels are kind of set in the early modern period, but uh, I did a Tudor trilogy, and then I did another one which kind of fits with the trilogy. So it's it's like a quartet now, really. And the first one of which is Queen's Gambit which um, is being adapted into a film called Firebrand, which is out in this autumn, I think, autumn or winter in the UK, but it premiered at Cannes recently, which was a wild trip. Yeah, and they, so they that follows Catherine Parr. I'm interested really in women who have been maybe either misunderstood by history or forgotten by history. So that that's my kind of the premise of my work. Wonderful. And you mentioned your your novels set in Tudor England, the four novels. So what is it about this particular period, the Tudor period, that so captivates you? Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, we're very immersed in that period in England. You know, we learn about it at school and it's a period that, I don't know, it resonated with me. I read, you know, as a child, I read all those Jean Plady novels and I was very caught up in the the kind of idea of those, they were often about quite young girls. I remember one about Mary, Queen of Scots, and she was this girl growing up in a castle in Scotland with all her, they were called the Four Marys or something, all her, you know, and it's something that captured my imagination. But then I think as I got older, I just, I, you know, there are always documentaries on, on TV about 
the Tudors and about them. And it just really struck me about particularly the wives of Henry VIII and the brutality of the way they were treated. It's so horrifying. And I I, I think I, I want to, wanted to explore it deeper. I studied English as an undergraduate, English literature, and I found myself due to kind of, it was interestingly due to a timetabling thing, because I studied as a mature student and I did all my lectures and seminars in the evenings. And I had young children at the time and I was a single mom. So I had to, I had someone who would do babysitting in lieu of a room in my, you know, a a room in my house. And so the nights that she did babysitting, I could, there were only two nights and I had to make those the nights I went into college. So I ended up doing a course called um, Writing from the English Civil War. (laughs) And it was, you know, I would never have chosen that, but somehow it kind of, it introduced me to a lot of women writers coming out of that period. That was really one of the periods when women started to make themselves heard. And then I became so interested in that. I ended up doing another course in Renaissance Women Writers and discovered that Catherine Parr had been a a writer and not only a writer, but a writer of great renown and huge success. And I thought, I really, I have to write a novel about her. But as I was not, I, you know, I was, I'm not a historian. And I thought, well, do I have the right to really take her story? And, and it took me a while. And and I had an agent who just said, you know, listen, if that's the story you want to write, just write it. You know, you, if you do your research, it's fine. You don't have to be a historian to write historical fiction. So that got me over that little kind of you know, a sort of sense that it, it it wasn't my story to tell. And and Catherine Parr was really the start of my kind of published career. Yeah. So I've got her to thank for that. Yeah, that's so wonderful. And so tell us a little bit about the protagonists of the other Tudor novels. So we've got Catherine Parr. Okay. We've what got about Catherine the other? Parr. And then the next one is called Sisters of Treason. And that is um it focuses on the the three Grey sisters. So Lady Jane Grey, who Tudor, Tudor enthusiasts will know exactly who Lady Jane Grey is, but a lot of people haven't haven't got a clue. They vaguely heard of her, and she th- thinks she was queen for seven days. But uh, you know that's about all, and nobody really knows why. But actually, I wanted to focus on her younger sisters who were in a really perilous position at court in the transition between Mary Tudor, or Bloody Mary as she's often known, and Elizabeth Tudor, and they had to negotiate but because they were so close to the throne they were in great danger so there you know Tudor blood uh, more more a curse than a blessing they're fascinating um let Mary Gray was disabled she had quite a severe scoliosis and um she was also very very small and you know, this is all documented. There's one portrait of her where her disabilities are obviously hidden. But I also I wanted to explore that, the idea of a young, disabled noblewoman at court. And no one knows about her. And she did have a, a fascinating story. Both sisters had this incredible spirit and defiance, but they were both very, very different in terms of character. So that's Sisters of Treason. And then the third in the trilogy is Watch the Lady. It's about the sister of the Earl of Essex, Penelope Blunt. And, um, well, she was a, a really considered a great beauty at court. And those are never re- that's never really a great criteria for me to want to write about a woman, that she was considered a beauty. But my goodness, she had... She had so much character and so much, so much tenacity. And, you know, she became kind of uh, almost unwittingly involved in her brother's coup to try and, well, you know, it's, she she wasn't part of the, the instigation of the coup. She didn't think it was a good idea, but she became enmeshed in it. Um, and obviously her brother lost his head. But she was very interesting because she was another woman who kind of trod her own path. So that's Watch the Lady. And uh, then the fourth Tudor novel is The Girl in the Glass Tower, which is about Arbella Stewart, who was the the Tudor queen who never was really. Well, she would have been a Stuart queen, but she was cousin of Elizabeth, cousin, you know, she was, she came from the the Margaret Tudor line. Uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, was her great aunt. I'm trying to see if I can get this all right. (laughs) The the family tree is so complicated. And we all know that Elizabeth refused to name an heir, but she did kind of toy with naming an heir every now and again. And, and Arbella was one of the women she she talked about in 
private as being her successor during a period of time. Well, we know that never happened, but poor Arbella had a really shockingly desperate life. She was sort of raised to be a queen and then found herself imprisoned and had to try and escape. And uh, it was an extraordinary life, actually. Um, and she was raised in Hardwick Hall, which is one of, if you, if you ever get the chance to visit it, it is one of the most extraordinary Elizabethan buildings in England. I mean, it's, it's in Derbyshire. A day trip to Hardwick and Chatsworth would be a great day trip. And, and, and Bolsover Castle, which is also just down the road, which is another wonderful house. But Hardwick Hall uh, is where she was raised. And it, it was like a, a palace designed really by her grandmother, Bess of Hardwick, another extraordinary Elizabethan woman who basically raised her and raised her to be a queen. And then, of course, she never was and ended up in the Tower of London like so many of my protagonists. <laughs> yeah, so those are my Tudor novels. Oh, they're all absolutely fascinating women and wonderful novels. And and I want to talk a little bit more about Firebrand. This is very exciting. So as you mentioned, this is the new film based on your amazing novel, The Queen's Gambit. So how did you feel, Elizabeth, when you found out that it was going to be adapted for the screen? Well, Queen's Gambit was published in 2013, so that's 10 years ago. The year before that, I had already sold the screen option. And so... 11 years it took and it was when it must have been it was during lockdown I got a call from the producer because those things it's like you think well it's never going to happen it's you know they the, a lot of books get optioned and it never happens or you know that the secret history a hugely successful book optioned and, and then nothing really has happened with it ever and the film never got made so that's kind of a common story but during lockdown I, I knew the option was up for renewal quite soon and I got a call from the producer which never really happened and she said yeah well we've got it looks like it's going to happen and they'd got a, a an actress they, they actually had Michelle Williams attached to play Catherine Parr and in fact she had to pull out because she became pregnant and Alicia Vikander was became Catherine Parr eventually who I had seen a there's a film about her playing a, an English princess who is married to a Danish, the the heir to the Danish throne, early 18th century, and uh, called A Royal Affair. It's a Danish, la Danish language film. I highly recommend it. I saw it about 10 years ago, and I thought, oh, if Alicia Elis Vikander could play a heroine in one of my novels, it would be a dream come true. So the dream came true, which is amazing. Yes, and Jude Law is playing Henry VIII, which I can't begin to explain the transformation, I mean, it's an extraordinary performance he gives. And in a sense, the two of them are so amazing together because she's this, this very cool, everything going on under the surface with her and this exterior where she shows so little, but you see, you know, just a tiny gesture. It's really subtle. And he, he so she's like kind of ice and he's like fire. He's really terrifying because he'll change, his mood will change on a penny. Um, and the combination of them is is just extraordinary. It was really amazing to watch my characters spring to life on the screen like that. I mean, they've taken quite a few liberties with history, but in a sense, as the essence of her story and what she went through, there was a plot on her life. I mean, many of your listeners will know her her story, so they've taken the, that the time when the, the plot on her life occurred and turned it into a kind of almost like a kind of dark fairy tale in a way. It's it's um transposed to a single setting. So it's not it's not like the book which covers a lot more of her life and you know but it, it captures the very essence of my Catherine Parr and my Henry VIII, who are obviously fictional creations. And the director Karim Ainuz, it's his first English language film. He's a Brazilian, uh, a Brazilian Algerian director. And so he brings a different perspective on the English monarchy of that period. And so I think it's a really, really interesting take. And I I really, I'm really behind the film. I really, really like it, though it's very different. And I think maybe because it's very different, it makes it 
easier for me to to love it. But, mm-hmm. You know, I feel if it was very, very similar, but not quite right, <laughs> not <laughs> quite like my book, you know, that might have been more difficult. Anyway, it's a thrill. The whole thing's been a thrill. It premiered in Cannes just a couple of months ago, which was the most extraordinary thing. And, uh, uh, you know, a, a dream of a life, really. Yeah. So, yeah, that I consider myself amazing. Very lucky. Oh. I cannot wait to see it. I, I hope we get to see it down under. Otherwise, I'll have to find a way to see it. So, oh, like, you will, you will, because I met the uh, Australian distributor at the, that weekend. So it's definitely got distribution in in Australia, oh, so and happy. and I, I think Amazon Prime have taken it okay. for streaming rights pretty much internationally. I'm not sure about North America. They uh, they had a different a different deal in the making, but so streaming rights will be really very very wide internationally and cinema releases I think it'll be released in cinemas in in most territories. So yeah, it'll be this winter for the run up to the awards season. So fantastic. And I was just going to say just for the benefit of our listeners that perhaps haven't read your novel. Do you want to just tell us, and you've obviously said that your novel captures more of a a time period than the film does. Do you want to just tell us briefly about the themes of your, the main themes of your novel, Queen's Gambit? Okay. Yes. I mean, I really focus on, I focus on Catherine Parr's life from the death of her husband, Lord Latimer, and then her, I I want to say decision to marry the king. the, the, the decision wasn't really hers. She was obliged to marry the king. He had set his sights on her. And, and I've characterized her as somebody who wasn't really afraid of him in the war. You know, didn't, you know, everybody around him would agree with everything he said, you know, would let him win at chess. And they play a chess game in the beginning, hence the name Queen's Gambit. And she beats him and he's so astonished and he admires her so much for it. And so he kind of recognises someone in a sense who's an intellectual equal because she's a highly intellectual woman and also highly political, something he wasn't so aware of at the time. So I think he liked to discuss things with her, particularly about politics and faith, which were inextricably joined at the time, obviously. And she was much, much more of a reformer than anybody realised. I mean, I think they considered her a, a safe bet, you know, that she wouldn't rock any boats. And But actually, she was highly motivated for reform. And that posed a serious problem. And, you know, I've kind of focused on her as an intellectual. She had never had any children. that She'd had two mar- marriages prior to, to the king and never, ne- never produced a child. So... I look at her in in a sense as a stepmother to the to the three royal children, Mary, who was only four years younger than her, and Elizabeth and Edward, obviously, and particularly on her influence over Elizabeth, who had an opportunity to see Catherine Parr take the reins as regent while Henry was fighting a, ca- a rather disastrous campaign in France. I wanted to look at this idea of the, you know, female rulers and how society had to kind of turn itself up on its head to accommodate the uh, the notion of a female sitting at the top of the tree when everything was structured in this way, you know, God at the top, the king underneath, and, you know, the, the queen beneath the king and the family representing that as well with the man as the head of the household and the woman underneath. And, you know, men were in charge of everything. The idea of a woman being capable of ruling a country just seemed anathema. So in a sense, I look at that 50 years within the quartet of books, I look at that 50 years of female rule, which really, in a sense, I see as starting with Catherine Parr as stepmother to those children, and to particularly to Elizabeth. I try to kind of unpick that seam of connection between, you know, and really display the seam of connection between Catherine Parr and Elizabeth that runs right through that half century. Yes. And then so, you know, she obviously she survives. We know that she survives uh, through till the death of Henry VIII and and then goes on to marry a man who turns out not to be quite what she'd what she thought he was, really. And so I also wanted to look at that idea of the highly intelligent woman who can still be a fool for love. You see it. You see it happening all the time. You know, that's it's um, how, you know, in a sense, she was romantically naive, yet so, so astute in so many other ways. 
Thomas Seymour. Not Thomas a good Seymour, guy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that's the question most people asked me about the film. Like, who plays Thomas Seymour? Who plays Thomas Seymour? He's thought of as this really marvellously romantic, gorgeous, strapping, but he's a really, really, really unpleasant character. I'd probably say he's, you know, in today's parlance, he's a narcissist, you know. And but he's played by Sam Riley, who's a really interesting actor. He's kind of hot but dark <laughs> there's, that, there's something you know he's very he's very intense performance and and yeah he works very well he's got the big beard right <laughs> both the Seymours have the big beards and so they're very the costumes are incredibly authentic yeah they've really really I mean there was not a stitch of nylon on the set everything was you know down to the dyes of the fabrics everything was authentic so the look of it, it feels so much of the period and the lighting, it's it's quite something to, to behold. It doesn't feel like one of those modern, shiny, gorgeous productions. It's dark. It's frightening. It's, you know, there's this sense of claustrophobia. It reflects that there's a sense of claustrophobia with Catherine in the court. And it really, really, really reflects that. Yeah, I think I saw it described as a horror film in one in, in one yeah. article. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's more a thriller. Um, but there are sort of slight elements of like, oh, uh, you know, right. there is a sort of feeling of, it's got that feeling of a horror film. You know, they're all trapped in this place with a with a monster and nobody quite knows how he's going to react to and to any event and so they're all on tenterhooks so it has got that atmosphere of a horror film yeah and of course it's called firebrand because we couldn't call it queen's gambit because it everybody was so confused by the title yeah. being confused with the queen's gambit which was uh the adaptation of walter tevis's novel about the female chess player that was such a huge lockdown success which is a shame because i love the title but there you go firebrand's a great title and i've actually done a new edit of the novel so it's the same novel but it's I've tidied it up. I've written a new introduction. It probably reads more smoothly. Um, I've given a little bit more space to the prose. I've I've divided it into more, into more more chapters, so it's kind of it's got a little bit more room to breathe. And yeah, so it's going to be published as Firebrand. Obviously, there'll be a reference to Queen's Gambit on the on the cover, so people won't have bought the same book twice unless they want to. Yes, and so that will be coming out in this autumn to coincide with the with the movie release here in the UK. I don't know about other territories, but it's definitely Simon and Schuster are, are bringing it out in the US. That I know. It's uh, it that's all happening, which is super exciting. It was really exciting for me to revisit my first novel and. You know, to you, I don't. Not many writers get the opportunity to go back to something they've written and kind of take out the things they didn't like about it. You know, some of the little prose ticks that I have. You know, that, so I was pleased to do that, and and I'm really excited to be able to see Firebrand on the shelves. Yes, that that is really exciting, and I just wanted to return to to Jude Law's performance for a moment because I have I've I've seen rave reviews of his performance, and you obviously are echoing that in what you're saying. I just wanted to ask you about the horrifying perfume that he apparently wore. What can you tell us <laughs> yes, about that? That was a real thing. Yeah, yes. So I think it it kind of made the papers. It was a really a, a funny anecdote that he on set he got really immersed. He's very method in his approach to acting, so he got really immersed he learned to play the instruments he you know he completely kind of got d- down and dirty with with his research and he had read somewhere and and I've read it somewhere too that um Henry VIII's suppurating ulcer the thing that eventually killed him stank so badly he could be smelt three rooms away and th- those rooms were not small either <laughs> and so he ha- he worked with the perfumier to concoct a smell that would smell like a suppurating ulcer. The old blood, fecal matter, mm. rotting flesh. Mmm, mmm. Delicious. <laughs> and he just, when he initially went on set, he used a tiny bit of it just to get himself in the kind of, you know, the frame of mind for his character. And, and of course, when Kareem, who's a real character, 
the director, when he got wind of it, he had that stuff sprayed all around the set. And you see it in takes. They're all the, you know, the, the ulcers kind of revealed, kind of maggoty ulcer. And everyone goes, they're trying not to show their disgust, but it's really revolting. And, um, it, you know, it created an atmosphere that, you know, just creates another level of authenticity, really. You know, that they are smelling the smell they would have smelled back then nearly 500 years ago and it did really really stink i could i did i wasn't in the in the actual room where that where it was sprayed but i could still smell it one, one day when i was on set and so you've obviously talked about the fact that you're you're happy with the overall production and you mentioned the costumes and i just want to bring them up again because i totally agree with you they just from the the little snippets i've seen they look amazing my dear friend dr owen emerson who loves french hoods was just beside himself when he yeah. saw the very authentic hoods so and do you want to comment on the anything else on the costumes yeah, well, that was the French hood, you know, the one that like sits flat to the oh, head. Oh, it's beautiful. And, yes, I know all the Tudor geeks were really going, you know, get, getting off on that particular thing because a photograph was released and it did the massive rounds on Twitter that that the the cost, you know, the costumes were going to be something something exciting. And actually at Heva they've got this exhibition of film costumes at the moment, and so I think yeah, Owen, who I also know, um was uh, very excited about that. It'd be great to, to if, they, if they could show the costumes from Firebrand there at some point. So the costumes took up were the, the most expensive part of the entire budget. And the costume designer, Oscar-winning Michael O'Connell, he oversaw kind of every aspect of making, of accuracy. So even down to the undergarments and everything. So they've got all the beautiful black work, hand-stitched. They've got some of the famous... People will recognise them. Some of the famous clothing that we see in the, the portraits that we all know. There's Henry VIII portrait with the white silk doublet, I suppose it is, a, a, with, with a little black work stitching in a brocade pattern. It's very, very familiar. And he, Jude wears that and you think, oh, I've seen that. It's familiar. Catherine Parr, the famous National Portrait Gallery picture with the red high collar and the hat she wears well she wears that she wears other dresses that we've seen Elizabeth in the red dress the famous that that one you know we see those those familiar things and but they are brought to life and they're not they're not those bright colors that you often do get in you know and look magnificent in many costume dramas they're those muted natural dyes and then you know the the brighter colours are the ones that the the royalty are wearing, you know. That, so you really see that sense of the hierarchy and the clothing. It's really remarkable. I mean, I couldn't quite believe it when I saw it. And there's one absolutely fantastic scene which um, I was on set for, and it's the May Day kind of festival. And, I mean, it's, it's like a tiny, you know, f- only a few minutes on screen. But it was like two full days of shooting. And I was there for one of those days. And some of the costumes of the mummers uh, were unbelievable. They've got, you know, all the, the the green man with all his, you know, dressed up and all covered in leaves. But they've got the horse, all these, they're like kind of fancy dress costumes of different strange animals. and But they're all kind of made of sackcloth and shaped into strange hairs and creatures of kind of folkloric creatures. They were extraordinary, so beautifully made. And there there was a monkey permanently on set and a parrot. And it was incredible. I mean, so it's so immersive. And the set was so immersive that you really felt you had walked back in time. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the premiere. I saw you post a couple of pics on on Twitter <laughs> yeah. and it looked like so much fun. So can you can you tell us any more about yeah. that? Well, I had never been to Cannes Film Festival. Uh, why would I? So I went with my son and we, I mean, we went, it was a flying visit two days in and, the, you know, the, the, we were there one day. There was a, a lovely dinner with the, some of the cast and the director and the producers on the night before, which was really nice, kind of see everybody again and um then the 
the premiere, you you know, in Cannes, if it's one of the, the films that are in the main competition, it's a red carpet. They have a really strict dress code. The men have to wear dinner suits and women have to wear, you know, evening dress. And everybody's like, what are you going to wear? What are you going to wear? But I'm very lucky. I've got a friend who used to work for Alexander McQueen. So I was sorted. Oh, that's great. <laughs> They, you, they don't let you in if you don't wear the proper shoes and everything. I mean, it's really, really strict. So I was quite worried, but, you know, I didn't need to be. And then so a friend of mine said, who's a producer, said, look, go early because then you can go into the auditorium and sit and watch the red carpet on the because they stream it on the big screen. So that's what we did. And you do, you know, you queue for a little bit and there are these banks of photographers and you walk up the red carpet. Obviously, they're not interested in me, but they're interested in all these other people wearing, I don't know who they were wearing their unbelievable outfits and lots of supermodels. They're all there. I think they represent all the fashion houses. And, and then this, the auditorium is, it's, it's more than 2,000 people. It's huge. I've never been in a cinema like that. And um, so we watched the whole red carpet, all the the cast and the director and the producer, they all come on and they, you know, Alicia was there with her husband, Michael Fassbender, and Jude where, was there with a very, very natty 1970s moustache, which is for a part he's playing. And um, and then they all, they the, the tradition is they all go and they do their f- kind of photo opportunities separately and then they all get together holding hands and they walk the red carpet in a row together and then they stand on the stairs. There's a sort of set of famous red stairs and um, they have lots of photographs taken. So we watched all that from inside and then they they come in and it's huge applause and then the film goes on, dead silence. And um, yeah, I mean, I had seen the film already like this was my fourth time to see it. So I I um, knew what to expect. But what I didn't expect was one, to see my name up on the whole full screen saying, you know, Elizabeth Fremantle adapted from the, the novel Queen's Gambit. The whole screen, it was, that was, I, <laughs> I took a picture of it. I was so complete. I nearly fell out of my seat, really. I mean, you know, it's coming, but you think you might get a tiny little yeah. credit somewhere, but whoa. <laughs> and then it kind of made me realise that, you know, that it was a pinch me moment, put it like that. I kind of couldn't quite believe it. And then there's this extraordinary applause that I had heard about in Cannes. They have these, you know, really, really extraordinary standing ovations. And they had, and it went on and on and on and on for about eight minutes or something. They just didn't stop applauding. I've never known anything like it. Yeah, so that was... That was the experience. I mean, it was quite something. And then the after party, you know, the kind of bank <laughs> security. And, and, oh, it was it was it was so much fun. And there's just all the cast there and, you know, chatting. It was, you know, a little taste of the, the A-list life, yes, I guess. Yeah. It was fun. You know, you finish your you, you take a sip of your champagne, it's refilled immediately. And <laughs> Love my it. son last, I can tell you. <laughs> It sounds was, extraordinary. It was amazing. It really was a, a wild ride. And Cannes is the most bonkers place. I, you know, it's, ext- it's really, I've never known anything like it. So well, that was. Well, it you was, sound, you know, you sound so enthusiastic about the film and so supportive, which is wonderful. It's so wonderful because it doesn't always work out that way, does it? So, so what are some of your other favorites? Just to kind of bring the conversation to a close, what are some of your other favorite book to screen adaptations? Do you have any? Oh, okay. Well, I don't. I mean, I have loads. I have yeah. loads. But the one I mentioned earlier, A Royal Affair yes. with Alicia Vikander, that. I think I really, really recommend that. That's another of those. It was a small independent film and that, you know, you really get a sense of period. It's fantastic. And she plays a really interesting character who I'd not heard of before and who's very much a, a, a young woman who becomes enmeshed in the Enlightenment, which was, a, you know, it was, again, dangerous, dead dangerous books. They, you know, ideas that could shake the boat. So that's a really interesting one, A Royal Affair. It's Danish, but you could probably find, I'm sure you can find it on streamers now with subtitles. Another I really love, and they're all a bit obscure, but La Reine Margot, or which is a French film with Isabella Gianni about the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. 
It's brutal. It's brutal. And it's the most fantastic film. It's got one of, you know, what those sort of French films do. There's something, another, in another way, it's another of those, it has, it really smacks of authenticity. So that La Reine Margot, or I don't know what it's called in English, Queen Margot? Yeah, I think probably. But it's an adaptation of an Alexandre Dumas novel. Yes. And I mean, I love the Elizabeth films. I know they've been really widely criticised because they, I don't know why, you know, people, I don't know why, actually. I really, really love, there's this sort of real sense of, I think Kate Blanchett is, oh, she's one of yours, isn't she? She's she's an Australian (laughs) actress. And I, I don't know, she made the role of Elizabeth very human and you know, there, be, there have been so many screen Elizabeths, <laughs> so many. But there was something, you know, uh, uh, in that moment, and it was probably, what was it, 20 years ago, the first one, she really brought it down to earth. You saw her as a young woman striving to become something, to, to gain the respect. And yeah, I, I love those films. The second one is, I think the first one is the better one. But, you know, I could watch them over and over and over. I just wanted to ask you something else. So in terms of the, so Alicia and, and Jude Law, so you feel like, obviously from what you've said, you've been praising their performances. So you feel that they really captured the essence of Catherine Parr and of Henry VIII? Yes, I do. I really do. It was funny because to see Alicia, I was initially quite worried because she looks so young. She's, I mean, she is in her thirties, but she has, I mean, I can't, the skin, never seen anything like it. It's just like absolutely She's got this perfect skin. She could be 20. Lucky her. And I thought, oh, how is she going to come across as this woman who, in the, you know, in terms of the period, was an older woman? You know, she was a, a middle-aged woman in her 30s. And we, but we don't consider it that now. And I thought, how is that going to translate? But you know, she does her performance really, really gets that idea that, you know, the older thinking, the woman who's lived, she really, really does. Uh, project that but and also if you look at the portraits there's a new portrait isn't there that's come yes. up for oh, all stunning. I don't know if only what we had a special uh, a spare million pounds that's right. um, and she actually did look very young so yes, you know I think right. it may you know that I actually think you know when I think about it she she may well have looked exactly as Alicia looked and you know so I, I think uh, she, I think she was a good fit. I think Jude was the one. You know, people were surprised. They go, oh, well, Jude Law was going to wear a fat suit," but <laughs> no one could imagine it. But I think there's that sense of him as a. We all remember him as that beautiful, glamorous young man. I mean, really gorgeous. You know, movie star looks as a young man, and we remember that. And you see flashes of that in his performance. And I think Henry VIII was this glamorous, young, beautiful young man you know the talk of all the courts of Europe and so you know there's that mirroring there which I think is very clever in the the, you know clever decision by the director yes that's a really interesting parallel I I had never really thought of that so that's really interesting and I just have a final question for you in regards to your new novel Disobedient can you just tell us a little bit about that well not strictly a Tudor novel but it's set in 1611 in Rome Disobedient tells the story of Artemisia Gentileschi, who she was not the first female painter of the Renaissance, but really the greatest, I think. I mean, there were uh, others, uh, Sophie Nisba Anguissola, who, who was earlier, about 50 years earlier, who painted, I mean, she was an extraordinary portraitist and, you know, was at the, you know, portraitist, you know, an official portraitist at the court of Philip of Spain. But Artemisia was the first person to really tackle the big subjects. And her great masterpiece, Judith Slaying Holofernes, is the most extraordinary, brutally violent piece of art. And the only person who had portrayed that same scene prior to that with the, you know, Judith in the act of beheading the enemy, uh, the enemy general was Caravaggio. So she was this bold, free spirit growing up in a time when there was no place for bold, free spirits. And her biography is really extraordinary. And my novel, Disobedient, it it covers just a year in her life when she was 17 and she undergoes some extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult hurdles to achieve her dream to be a painter judged beside her male peers. And and she achieves that. And this year in her life is really full of 
extraordinary trauma and difficulty, but she overcomes it. And um, she's a survivor. And I think it's in a sense, it's a novel that speaks to the generation where she's a, a survivor of rape. And it speaks to a generation of women who are now being able to talk about their own experiences of, of sexual assault. And um, without wanting to kind of go too heavily into it, it's a, it's a novel about someone who not only overcomes those difficulties, but really turns them into to generate something brilliant. And so she, you know, she turns the tables on on the events of her life and, and turns them into something, something incredibly positive. Yeah, she's an amazing woman. That sounds brilliant. And when is that one being released? Okay, so it's published here. And I think we have simultaneous UK Australian, I think it's published a week later in the US. July the 27th and I so I think it's August the mm, I want to say the 8th or something in in the US yeah and yeah at the moment it's not going to be published just yet in any foreign language territories but we've definitely got all the English language sewn up yeah oh wonderful so we could probably pre-order now then just so we get our copy you certainly can (laughs) pre-order yes so please do it's uh it's I have to say it's a novel I'm extremely proud of. And I feel like I've, I want to say it might be my best work, but you know, that's always in the judge of the, you know, in the eyes of the beholder, really. But there is a kind of link back to Catherine Parr. I feel like Artemisia and Catherine Parr have, there's a sort of sisterhood there. They have similar aspirations. Catherine Parr is a writer and a political activist, really. And Artemisia is a painter, you know, they, and they managed to achieve what they set out to do in terms of their, you know, their their lives outside the domestic arena, if you will. So yeah, they they are they're similar in some ways. That sounds wonderful. I'll be pre-ordering my copy after this conversation. I hope everyone else does too. So before I let you go, this has been so absolutely wonderful talking to you. I have a little thing that I do towards the end of our episodes, and that's just what I call 10 to go. So these are just 10 quick questions just to get to know you a little bit better. So the first one, what is a favourite holiday destination? I like going to the seaside in England. Um, So there's a place called uh, Albra on the coast in Suffolk, and I love going there. What about the last book that you read or one of the last books that you've read? The last book I read actually is I reread The Secret History by Donna Tartt because it was a long time since I'd read it and it really stands up. She's a terrific writer. Yeah, I remember loving it when I read it, but yes, I could probably do with reading it again. And so you mentioned Hardwick Hall. Are there any other favourite historic properties that you like to visit? Oh, Hever, Hever Castle. I mean, it's just a jewel, isn't it? It's a perfect, perfect, like miniature palace. It's, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's like the little castles you drew as a child. Like, it's just perfect. I agree Absolutely. with you. Yeah, yeah. And what do you do to relax and unwind? You've obviously been very busy of late. I swim. I like freshwater swimming. So I, there's a big pond uh, near where I live and I go swimming there every day if I can in whatever weather. <laughs> You're very brave on those cold English days. <laughs> yes. And what about an ideal Sunday morning? What does that consist of? Oh, well, I like to lie in and read. So I'll do, you know, I'll have a bit of a lie in and read. And also I have a housemate we like to do there are weekly quizzes in the newspapers so we were big on quizzing so we do the weekend quizzes in the morning and then I'll walk my dog hopefully go for a swim and yeah that's my that's my Sunday really coffee is usually involved as well that sounds perfect (laughs) and is there a new skill that you would like to learn oh I'm always wanting to learn new skills I'd love to learn kind of furniture upholstery. I'm really into mid-century modern uh, furniture and architecture. It's not really very kind of Tudor, but (laughs) it's, and I'm, you often see these like great chairs and things in junk shops, but they're, you know, the seats need re-upholstering and it's really expensive to do. I'd love to be able to do that myself. And pottery, actually, I really would love to, I did pottery as a child and I'd love to go back to pottery. So I keep telling myself I'm going to do it and then I don't do it. So... (laughs) And you mentioned a dog. So I was going to ask you if you had any pets or do you have any other pets or is it just a dog? I just have a dog. Yeah, I just have a dog. Lovely. And what about a mystery? And this can be a contemporary or a historical mystery, but something that you'd like to solve or know the answer to. Oh, wow. Gosh, well, there are a few, aren't there? I mean, you know, who killed the princess in the tower? And, there, you know, there, there are all sorts of things 
you know, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, other ones. Um, and of course, nothing springs to mind. And, That's not and happens, yeah, don't worry. so you know, but all those things, you know, it was extraordinary when the remains of Richard the Third were were found. And you just think that, you know, we learned something then about him and his physical self, something tangible and absolutely certain that we learned that that what we learned about a kind of legend of history was like where was it you know did, what, did he have a hunchback or didn't he we now know that he did and that, so those when the mysteries are solved I, I find that quite extraordinary yeah and lucky last question there are lots of our listeners that themselves would love to become novelists writers do you have any advice for them Oh, wow. Yeah, just don't give up. You know, I, it took me 10 years to get published from, you know, write, writing my first novel. I wrote three novels. They never got published. They were not historical. So it wasn't until I found Catherine Parr that I found my voice, really. And that was the novel that kind of started the whole, started my career as a writer, as a published writer. And um, don't give up. Uh, don't try and put everything in. If you're writing historical fiction, you know, you don't have to show everything you know. Sometimes historical fiction can get bogged down with a, a desire to tell all the facts. History books are for that. Historical fiction is for something different. It's for you to explore the possibilities of what, what might have occurred between the lines of history. That's wonderful, wonderful advice. Um, very inspiring as well. So I didn't realise it took you 10 years to have your first book. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Wow, look at the success now. That is that is wonderful. And the very last thing, and I promise I'll let you get on with your day, is our Tudor takeaway. So this is something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. So do you have a takeaway for us? Well, I do. I do. And I think it might be something you know about. But it's uh, it brings us back to Heva Castle and the curators there. And they have just discovered that the a prayer book is the prayer book in Holbein's famous portrait of Thomas Cromwell. So if you, if you can picture that he's there and at the front of the portrait is on a green baize table is this prayer book. And that's the prayer book. And it not only turns out to be, I think, the only surviving object that we know of in a Tudor painting to be identified which is something in itself. It is also the same edition of the prayer book that belonged to both Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. And this has all been the work of Owen and Kate and Alison, the curators at, at Heva, that they've uh, made those links between these prayer books. And how extraordinary that, you know, Catherine of Aragon, who was a Catholic, and Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell, who were reformers, to both have the same edition of a prayer book. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, in a sense, a little small but mind-boggling fact that we can know that. Yeah, so that's my takeaway. Oh, and it's a fantastic one. It is. It's an incredible find. And and I think we're going to be hearing more about it because it's brought up a lot of questions, as you say. Why did these people own the same book? So I look forward to hearing more. And this has been so wonderful, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk Tudors with us. Well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions, or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.